Hi, I'm Kristen Goodwin. On this episode of the Fox News Rundown, in the wake of George Floyd's death, there is a growing push from protesters to defund the police. Fox News Sunday host Chris Wallace joins the rundown to discuss why he thinks Democrats, including presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, are running as fast as they can from this movement and explains why he believes President Trump's push to hold campaign rallies this summer could backfire. And the debate over removing Confederate statues is reigniting amid civil unrest across the nation. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano discusses the legal challenges of taking away these monuments and also weighs in on Congress's efforts to reform America's police departments. Plus commentary from host of Fox Across America with Jimmy Fela, Jimmy Fela. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcast.com. I'm Stuart Vonney. I'm Martha McCallum. I'm Jason Chaffetz, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, June 12, 2020. I'm Chris Foster. The politics of the police. Defund the police, dismantle the police. I think that's a a bridge too far for most Americans and probably not where politically uh, Joe Biden and uh, Democrats running for election this year want to be. I'm Lisa Brady. There's a national outcry over the death of George Floyd, but there might not be a national answer to what's really a local question. There will probably never be a national police standard, but there will be a, a floor below which the police can't go. And I'm Jimmy Fallon. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. There's been a lot of talk this week about defunding the police, the idea being you strip away some of their budget and responsibilities, shifting them to other areas like social services or housing or youth programs. Supporters say in the end it would make communities safer. Detractors say less policing would make communities more dangerous. And President Trump says he won't let it happen. There won't be defunding. There won't be uh, dismantling of our police. And uh, they're not going to be any disbanding of our police. Our police have been letting us uh, live in peace, and we want to make sure we don't have any bad actors in there. Joe Biden on Comedy Central's Daily Show says he's for police reform and using federal money as incentive. We can make sure that we insist on certain fundamental changes take place now including giving, making sure there's sensitivity training, making sure that all of cops' uh, past grievances, or excuse me, uh, transgressions are all made public. Because we can say, if you don't, we are not going to provide the federal funding that we provide for you. But he came out early against the idea of actually breaking police departments up. I think that uh, Joe Biden and mainstream Democrats are doing everything they can to run away as fast as they can from defund the police. Chris Wallace is the host of Fox News Sunday and author of the new book, Countdown 1945, the extraordinary story of the atomic bomb and the 116 days that changed the world. Most people, myself included, fully understand what that even means. (laughs) But I think most people, when they dial 911, when they're in emergency, want the police to answer and to help. So... Reform the police, uh, change some practices, like maybe have a national registry of bad actors or maybe limit uh, the, the immunity that policemen have from being sued, civil suits. But defund the police, dismantle the police. I think that's a, a bridge too far for most Americans and probably not where politically uh, Joe Biden and uh, Democrats running for election this year want to be. I guess the idea other than the most militant calls to just gut police departments is to just is divert some resources and make them less social workers and uh, substance abuse counselors and and give some money to that instead and have police officers be police officers but uh, the label certainly doesn't help the cause no and look there's another problem because of the economic uh crisis uh, that that has been uh occasion by the the COVID-19, you're going to see a lot of cities and states, because Congress is not rushing to help them, uh, with big budget problems. And their budgets for the police may already be in trouble. So the idea you're going to cut further um, is, uh, I think, going to create a lot of uh, heartburn among big city mayors and big city police chiefs. Well, Joe Biden is way up in just poll after poll. You've said several times on this show that he can't campaign from his basement in Delaware, but mostly so far it, it's working for him. Yeah, I think, frankly, it's working for him uh, because the president has had a couple of really bad weeks. 
And uh, I don't know that he can count on that all the way from now till November. Um, you, you look at the polls and the president's approval rating in Gallup dropped 10 points from May to June. And what I really think it's about um, is is that at a time of tremendous upheaval and division and polarization and protests, uh, the president was seen as a source of division, not a source of unity and a source of, of, of uh, binding the nation's wounds. I mean, to have in a single week the, be called out by everybody from the uh, archbishops of uh, the Episcopal and Catholic Church in Washington to top military uh, leaders, retired leaders like uh, uh, General Mattis and uh, Admiral Mullen, that's that's tough. That's very tough. And I don't think uh, most Americans want to see uh, a president in that situation. He's got to find a way to, to make it clear he's not the president of his base. He's the president of all Americans. And I think that's what that's what a lot of voters are starving for right now. If you look at the polls during Tuesday's primary in Georgia, there were reports of hours long lines at some polling places and problems with ballot shortages and voting machines, especially in majority minority neighborhoods. Georgia Congressman Doug Collins, he's a Republican fighting Kelly Loeffler, another Republican for her Senate seat in a special election in November, tells Fox. Counties are the responsibility for putting up and setting up their elections as it goes uh, and putting enough voting machines, having enough uh, trained workers in to get that done. It's concerning to me that it seems like, especially in our metro areas, we seem to have the same problems over and over again. This was all even though more people voted by mail this time, with more expected to vote by mail in the November general election. First of all, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis we're now seeing is, is far from over. We're seeing spikes in a lot of states that either never shut down or opened quickly and didn't have as, as strict uh, mitigation measures in, in effect. So, you know, it's very possible, maybe not, I hope not, but it's very possible that we're going to see serious virus problems in October, November when people want to vote. And, you know, it's it's important for people to vote, and, and you certainly don't want people getting sick or being afraid to vote because of the fact that, uh, that, that you know, they may get sick from the virus. And, um, you know, the idea that if you do go to vote, you can't uh, because there's some technical problem with the machines or the poll workers don't know what they're doing. Or in some cases in Atlanta, the poll workers weren't wearing masks, so people were scared off by them. Um, you know, it just seems in the midst of this pandemic that mail-in voting uh, is is the wise course. And, you know, despite some statements by the president, you just look at the facts. There is almost no incidence of fraud in mail-in voting. It's less than a thousand cases with more than a billion votes cast uh, since the year 2000. Speaking of Krona, um, President Trump is... There's risk and reward. He's looking forward to starting rallies again next Friday in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Maybe he can turn the energy up. Uh, but again, there's risk and reward there. He gets free media. He gets himself energized. But if people start to get sick, that's not great. No. And, and you know, the issue itself of even holding uh, the mass rallies, mass groups, uh, even wearing a mask, there's a political divide there. Uh, Democrats are overwhelmingly uh, in favor of wearing masks, social distancing, and Republicans are much more skeptical of it. And, you know, I just have to say that that in a in the midst of a, a pandemic, the idea that wearing masks should become a political issue is, I think, a pretty good symbol of everything that's wrong with our body politic today. Chris Wallace, the host of Fox News Sunday, his new book out now is Countdown 1945, the extraordinary story of the atomic bomb in the 116 days that changed the world. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. This is Jimmy Fallon with your Fox News commentary coming up. Responding to overwhelming calls for change after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, President Trump is working on a four point plan. Part of his focus is to address economic inequality, including health care disparities in minority communities. But he's also calling for police reform. We're working to finalize an executive order that will encourage police departments nationwide to meet the most current professional standards for the use of force, including tactics for de-escalation. 
It would also encourage pilot programs that allow social workers and some law enforcement officers to work together. That's a different approach than the sweeping plan from House Democrats, who want to require certain changes and ban certain tactics, like chokeholds and no-knock warrants. The federal government does not have the ability to prescribe the means by which local police do their work. Judge Andrew Napolitano was the Fox News senior judicial analyst. There are many aspects of uh, local and state governance that the feds cannot directly regulate. When they want to regulate something that they cannot directly regulate under the Constitution, they usually use the power of the purse, which some people consider generosity and other people consider bribery. So they will say to the states, here is $100 million. I'm just using this number as a hypothetical. Split it up amongst your police departments. But in return, the police departments must promise no no no-knock warrants and no chokeholds. So that's the way uh, Congress and the president get around the constitutional limitations on their ability to regulate local events. Now, will the states turn down the money? Lisa, they never turn down money. They are so cash-strapped, particularly now when people haven't been paying uh, sales taxes because they haven't been going to retail facilities in order to make purchases that generate that tax revenue. So then this argument of creating a true national standard for policing is sounds like a bit of a false argument. I mean, could Congress pass something that gives the federal government more control over local police protocols, or is just not constitutional to do that? It would, it would require a constitutional amendment because the Tenth Amendment reserves to the states health, safety, welfare, and morality, what we call the police power. So if the Congress wanted to change that, it, it would have to offer an amendment, which would require two thirds of each house and then three quarters of the state legislatures. Uh, that is simply not going to happen. There will probably never be a national police standard, but there will be a, a floor below which the police can't go. Theoretically, that floor is the Bill of Rights, but we know that's not the case because the highest right is the right to live, and, and we all saw George Floyd's life literally being choked out of him uh, on video. I wanted to ask you if it's harder to prosecute a police officer. And I don't just mean the issue of qualified immunity, which I would love for you to explain, but also because prosecutors rely on police for evidence and testimony in a lot of cases. Well, prosecutors work hand in hand uh, with police. So first, is it difficult to prosecute uh, a police officer? The answer is yes. And prosecutors who know the cops or work with the cops should not be prosecuting those cops. Uh, those charges should be transferred to another uh, city or county, depending upon how they break things up in a, in a given state. A, a different authority should prosecute the cops, not one that works with them and knows them. One of the reasons it's, a, it's difficult is because uh, lawyers are able to persuade judges to tell juries that cops are given a great amount of discretion and that they are only liable uh, for their intentional behavior. So once, once you give that charge to the jury, then the jury invariably uh, says, well, okay, I wouldn't have done this, and I think it was wrong, but it was within his discretion. That's when cops are being prosecuted for crimes, when they are being sued for civil wrongs, as the, municipal, as the Minneapolis Police Department will soon uh, be sued, individual police enjoy what's called qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is an immunity you have to qualify for. You qualify for it by being a bona fide police officer on a bona fide police mission. If a police officer arresting somebody for passing a phony $20 bill chokes the guy to death, as absurd as what I'm now about to say sounds, it is the law, the police officer enjoys qualified immunity. He cannot be sued for that. I have been arguing 
for years, since my years on the bench, observing police excesses, that there should be no qualified immunity, that the police should think twice before they use deadly force. George Floyd would be alive today, as would many others, white and black, if they, there was no qualified immunity, because the police would think, I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my mortgage uh, over this. It's not worth it. I'm not going to kill this guy person. I'm just going to uh, restrain him. But if Congress wants to step in and try to get rid of qualified immunity... They can't. Um, they have to do the same thing as the chokeholds and the no-knocks. Pay the states to get rid of it. The reform debate is also turning attention to the power of police unions. That's where the Minneapolis police chief, Madaria Arredondo, started when he unveiled his own reform plan this week. I am immediately withdrawing from the contract negotiations with the Minneapolis Police Federation. He's hoping to make reforms part of the contract, without saying if he thinks making enough changes would end city council efforts to dismantle the police department. But is it legal to do that anyway? Camden, New Jersey did it, but they replaced their old police department with a new one, and there was a state takeover first. Well, you know, it depends on where you are. Minneapolis and New York have city charters. Now, a city charter is like the Constitution. It's the document from which the city's powers come. A city charter is approved by the legislature and enacted by the voters. Theoretically, the city council can't change the city charter any more than Congress could change the Constitution. And most city charters, and again, I'm only going to use Minneapolis and New York because I know this to be so. There are thousands of cities. I obviously haven't seen all of their charters. Most city charters, notably Minneapolis and New York, require them to have a police department. So could they fire all the cops and bring in the state and start all over again? Yes, they can. Uh, could they allow the following to happen, which exists in a city in America. When I tell you what city, I think you'll be surprised I'll hold the name for the end. Homeowners in a 20 or 30 block area voluntarily contribute to a fund and they pay for private police. The police work for the homeowners. The city police don't even go in this neighborhood. They can if they want, but they don't have to. They don't have to because there's absolutely no crime, no abuse, and everybody's happy. Now, that exists in, of all places, San Francisco. And it has existed in San Francisco in this same neighborhood for 100 years. Most people don't know it. Mrs. Pelosi's not happy with it because she'd rather have the government provide uh, all these services. I wanted to ask you also about the renewed fight over Confederate statues and other memorials. They've been targeted in protests. In Virginia now, though, there are two lawsuits trying to block the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue, um, one focusing on the original deed from 1890 that gave Virginia control of the statue, that one arguing that the monument and the area around it was supposed to be considered perpetually sacred, and then there's a second lawsuit arguing that removing it would violate the federal trademark, a federal landmark law. Well, those are two uh, worthy lawsuits. Now, I have a bias here, and my bias is that uh, we should not erase history. If, if these um, landmarks are on private property, there's nothing the government can do about it. It's freedom of speech. If they're on government property, well, then the deed regulates and if they have been – regulates the government's behavior, and in one case you're talking about it would require an act of the legislature, not just the governor. Uh, and in one of those cases, there, there is no way that they can uh, – as I've read the deed, that, they, that the state can get out of it other than buying its way out by paying the heirs of the deed to surrender their rights under the deed. In the national uh, landmark case, there's no way around it either. And I don't know which way judges are going to go. Sometimes judges follow the laws. Sometimes they they uh, bow in the and go with the wind. But uh, culturally, I'm opposed to this. Legally, the, the law has to be followed. The U.S. Defense and Army chiefs are ready to consider renaming some bases named after Confederate leaders. President Trump says he will not consider that. The president will not stand for that. The president will respect this because these forts and these names are associated with the heroes within them, not the name on the fort. 
White House spokeswoman Kelly McEnany expressing concern that changing names could imply the installations themselves are racist. But there is an effort underway in Congress. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The American people know these names have to go. A Senate committee already making the first move. Military bases are named by federal legislation. So it's, it's not just somebody tacked up Fort Bragg. So that would require legislation. If Congress passes it and the president vetoes it, they'd have to override his veto. And if they do, there's nothing he can do about it. Stated differently, his status as commander-in-chief does not give him sole, S-O-L-E, control over all uh, military uh, property. That's a congressional issue. The president's getting ready to start holding campaign rallies again. He's talking about maybe next Friday in Tulsa as the first one. Does that put his campaign at risk of lawsuits if someone gets COVID-19 at a rally? Yes. Yes. Now, there is the doctrine of assumption of the risk, meaning you are aware of the risk and you assumed it. But assumption of the risk does not absolve the defendant of liability. It reduces liability. So... Uh, if you go to one of these rallies and you uh, get sick and you lose income as a result of it and you sue and you win a judgment for your income, that judgment might be reduced by a certain amount that the jury decides was your fault for going anyway. But it doesn't block the suit and it doesn't bar the recovery. It just reduces the amount. What if they have people make reservations to attend a rally and have them sign a waiver. Would something like that eliminate the risk of liability? Probably not. Most of those uh, waivers are not worth uh, the paper that they're written on because a waiver can't, can't change the law. You hold a public gathering, you have a duty to provide uh, a safe place. I mean, suppose, God forbid, somebody shot up the gathering but you, you had signed a, uh, a waiver. Well, that's not going to bar you or your uh, estate from suing the people who failed to provide security. Every state in the union requires that every public accommodation, which is what the venue would be, uh, be basically safe for the purpose for which it exists. And the owner or occupier of that public accommodation is not at liberty to abrogate state law by, by getting somebody to sign a contract. It's a complicated world, Judge. It is. You ask great <laughs> questions. I almost forgot where you went to law school. <laughs> Fox, I learned them all from you, Judge. Fox Senior Judicial Analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Always a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for your time. All the best, Lisa. Thank you. It's the Perino and Steyerwalt I'll Tell You What podcast. Dana Perino of The Five and Fox News political editor Chris Steyerwalt dissect the ins and outs of national politics. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Subscribe to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. A 97-year-old Hawaii woman who recently attended a food drive now has meals on her table and a new friend. Maria Arakaki used her walker to get to the event at Aloha Stadium, about a half mile from her house. It wasn't an easy trip. Two months ago, I couldn't even walk into the corner. But I said, no, I think I'm going to try. When she got there, she learned she had to have a vehicle to get the food. If you don't go with a car... You cannot get anything. I said, Are you sure? I'm going. Mike Gangloff is the co-founder of the show Aloha Challenge, the group behind the food drive, and told KITV4 Island News what happened. A security guard came up to me and they said that there was a walker that was at the front gate. And then I said, oh, we, we're, we're not taking walkers, but, but, you know, let me go look anyway. I said, you know, do you want to go in the food drive? She said, mm, I walk, I walk far. I walk far from my, my uh, uh, house. So he helped Maria into his truck, got in line with everyone else, and drove her through the food drive, taking her back home with her new items and even helped her put them in the refrigerator. I, I never have a nothing free all my life, put the beginning with it. I never ask for nothing. I never get it. 
but I was happy for what I get. Maria says she'd never been to a food drive and that it made a big difference, telling Mike it was the most food she'd had on her table in months. I'm getting these texts, you know, from all the captains in charge of my show all over Challenge Food Drive. And, I, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I, I got to hurry up and get back to the food drive. And then Maria goes, how about a piece of cake? But instead of rushing back, he stayed for the cake and wound up talking with Maria for an hour. Now, they've both got a new friend. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Jimmy Fallon. What's on your mind? So Warner Brothers announced that Elmer Fudd is no longer carrying a shotgun in the newest Bugs Bunny episodes. Turns out he doesn't need one because some other Looney Tunes defunded the police and the rabbit gets killed by street crime. Which is not true, but whoever came up with this idea still needs to be very, very quiet in the next pitch meeting. Elmer Fudd is an absurd cartoon. It's pretend. And once you start injecting real-world politics into these scenarios, kids lose the escapism they get from watching them. The producers say they took away his gun because they're trying to be conscious of the message they're sending kids. Come on, man. If kids are taking Bugs Bunny seriously, shouldn't we be more concerned that they'll think rabbits can talk? That's going to be a seriously disappointing class trip to the petting zoo. Now, I'll admit, Mr. Fudd wasn't the most responsible gun owner in the world. The guy spent half his time sticking his head in the barrel and looking down the chamber, which they do not teach you in safety school. But if we're really going to take cartoons seriously, didn't we just violate the man's Second Amendment rights? Of course, the Elmer Fudd fiasco wasn't even the most cartoonishly stupid thing to happen this week. Get this, a group of activists are calling on Nickelodeon to cancel Paw Patrol because of the police dog in the cartoon. Lucky for them, it's not a drug-sniffing dog because I'm pretty sure he'd find some. Seriously, if you think cartoon police dogs are the problem, I do not want a hit of what you're smoking because chances are it is way too strong for me. These activists, which is slang for self-hating losers on Twitter, claim Chase the Dog reinforces the good cop stereotype at a time when children need to realize cops do plenty of bad. To which I say, you have the right to remain silent. What do you want them to do? Show the dog shaking down taxpayers, promising to help poor communities, and then doing nothing? He's a dog, not a Democrat. Kids shouldn't be taught to hate cops, and anyone telling you otherwise is a moron. And to be clear, I'm only calling them morons because the words I want to use aren't allowed on the radio. Look, folks, I don't know if you're keeping score at home, but this country is starting to look like Gotham City before Batman shows up. Although at the rate we're going, Batman wouldn't bother because they'd accuse him of being systemically biased against penguins. Police need our support right now more than ever. And to be clear, we need theirs. And in a week where adult shows like Live PD and Cops are getting yanked off the air, the message we've been sending cops is, you're on your own. Heaven forbid there should come a day where they say the same thing to us. At that point, we'll need Paw Patrol, not to mention Elmer Fudd's shotgun. So stop vilifying cops and stop policing children's shows. At the end of the day, nobody is getting their values from watching Warner Brothers cartoons. And if they are, we might as well call it a day because that's all, folks. Listen to Fox Across America with me, Jimmy Fallon, weekdays from noon to three on foxnewsradio.com. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.